morning everyone. I am Vinay Kumar. I am going to talk about hyperspectral remote sensing and its application. In this particular topic, I am going to cover basics of hyperspectral remote sensing, hyperspectral remote sensing sensors which are acquiring hyperspectral remote sensing data, and hyperspectral data processing techniques which includes data pre-processing and classification of hyperspectral data for generating various kinds of uh, maps. And then uh, hyperspectral data utility for various kinds of applications. So before that you should know about spectral reflectance curve. Spectral, uh, spectral reflectance curve if I talk about panchromatic band so that is a single band. For a single band you will get single reflectance value for each and every feature. So if I will talk about uh, uh, water body so it will give you lowest reflectance value and then if I will talk about urban features so urban features will give high reflectance value. So, uh, if I will talk about band multispectral, multispectral which is containing more number of bands so for each and every band blue, green, red, near infrared, software infrared you are getting different kind of reflectance value for each and every feature. So you are able to separate out all the uh, various uh, land cover features very clearly. But if you have to separate out spectrally similar features, you require hyperspectral remote sensing data which is giving you 100 to 200 spectral bands ranging from 400 to 2500 nanometer. So hyperspectral remote sensing is what? It is nothing but an uh, combination of spatial, spectral and radiometric information. So if you see this particular triangle, in this spectro spectrometer is what? It is a device which measures spectral distribution of electromagnetic radiation, radiometer for a particular wavelength if you are receiving uh, reflected energy and imager is which is giving you two dimensional image. If you combine all the three, it will give you the hyperspectral remote sensing sensor and spectroradiometer is what which is giving you for uh, spectral reflectance curve for each and every feature so you can see for uh, different wavelength what reflected energy is coming that is your spectroradiometer now because uh, it's very difficult to launch that kind of sensors which is containing 100 to 200 spectral bands so for that we are using different kind of technology to distribute the spectral separation of electromagnetic spectrum. So like prism here you can see where we are passing a monochromatic light and then spectral separation is taking place. Similarly diffraction grating based spectral separation can be done. So this kind of technology are used by hyperspectral remote sensing sensors. So hyperspectral remote sensing sensors are combination of imaging and spectroscopy. So you can see this particular image. In this image x, y is representing you the spatial information and z is representing you the spectral information. So if I am taking up talking about each and every pixel. So this pixel is giving you a kind of laboratory quality reflectance spectra. So for each wavelength what reflectance value you are getting. So that is drawn as a spectral reflectance curve. So normally it consists of 100 to 200 spectral bands and narrow band spectral bandwidth that is ranging from 5 to 10 nanometer. You can see one of the example of your uh, Rishikesh area data cube. So this is one of the Hyperion uh, standard false color composite data cube of Rishikesh and its surrounding. If you will see the band combination here I have used as 40, 30 and 20. Normally if it is the case of multispectral that is 4, 3, 2 or 3, 2, 1. But in this case 40, 30, 20 it means more number of spectral bands are there in your hyperspectral remote sensing sensor data. And these data sets are actually useful for distinguishing spectrally similar materials. So why hyperspectral remote sensing is able to identify different type of spectrally similar features. So you can see in this particular uh, curve actually the energy label whatever is getting absorbed in a particular wavelength is uh, the ab absorption feature which is actually distinguishing the various features. So in this curve you can see these are two uh, minerals kaolinite and alunite which is giving you the absorptions particular absorption in a particular wavelength. So according to that you are able to distinguish two minerals. So what kind of absorptions are taking place during data acquisition process which is able to separate out that I am going to tell you in my next slide. 
सो देर आर थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ एब्जॉर्बसन प्रोसेसेस चार्ज ट्रांसफर इलेक्ट्रॉन ट्रांजिशन एंड वाइब्रेशनल एब्जॉर्बसन सो एब्जॉर्बसन्स आर वॉट इंट्रैक्शन ऑफ इलेक्ट्रो मैग्नेटिक रेडिएशन विथ एटम्स एंड मॉलिक्यूल क्रिएट एब्जॉर्बसन फीचर्स इन स्पेक्ट्रा सो इफ यूल सी इन दिस पर्टिकुलर कर्व there are three mineral spectra and where you can see this t is indicating where the absorptions are taking place so this absorption are caused by various uh, reasons that is charge transfer electron transition and vibrational charge transfer occur mostly in the visible region and they are actually broad so that can be detected through your multispectral data but if some overlapping minerals are there so if you have to distinguish those two type of overlapping minerals so for that you require hyperspectral data electron transition absorptions are what in that atoms within an, an in complete electron cell light at proper wavelength can bump electrons into different positions in cell so that is narrower than your chance tra charge transfer absorption and uh, especially useful in for geological applications for vibrational absorptions when light at same wavelength as a molecule or part of a molecule strikes the molecule it causes the molecule to vibrate so these absorptions are actually very very narrow and normally originate at the longer wavelength of 0.4 to 2.5 micrometer in the short wave infrared region and this is also useful mainly for your mineral identification so you let us compare between multispectral and hyperspectral you can see in this particular images there are three data sets i have used landsat 7 etm plus that multispectral band bands uh, total six bands here it is used and eo and le where nine multispectral bands are there and hyperion data after doing the pre processing we left out with 140 bands so you can see here with the three uh, spectral reflectance curve of the vegetation the spectral nature of that vegetation features are coming but the absorptions are not distinguished with the six band data but when we increase the number of bands the absorptions are com started coming which is able to separate out various spectrally similar vegetation but still different type of vegetations cannot be identified with this particular information so you can see with hyperspectral data the peculiar absorptions are visible which is able to separate out the different type of vegetation species so multispectral instruments can discriminate materials hyperspectral is actually able to identify the materials multispectral data are used to detect the existence of materials and hyperspectral data are capable of even identifying the features which are present in mixed materials mixed pixels and lot of multispectral sensors are available so data sets are uh, available for uh, different areas but hyperspectral sensors are uh, very less only airborne sensors are there very few hyperspectral sensors are available even in indian context and whatever hyperspectral sensor indian hyperspectral sensor is available that is uh, having very coarse spatial resolution that is high c with 550 meter spatial resolution now if i'll talk about various types of hyperspectral uh, sensors these are the airborne hyperspectral remote sensing sensor casi is compact airborne spectrographic imager i this is hyperspectral mapper this is airborne visible infrared imaging spectrometer so recently this was uh, with the collaboration with nasa isro have collaborated with nasa and we have uh, flight this uh, everest hyperspectral sensor uh, in different parts of india for um, uh, air, um, to get airborne hyperspectral data for uh, hyperspectral data applications uh, for different applications or use utilizing hyperspectral data processing then coming to high dice this is developed by us naval research laboratory then digital airborne imaging spectrometer which is U with european technology and this is airborne imaging spectrometer and uh, airborne hyperspectral imager this two are developed by uh, space application center ahmed bad then coming to space borne sensors these are few of the uh, hyperspectral sensors modis which is containing 36 bands but it is having very coarse spatial resolution medis is also having very coarse spatial resolution that is medium uh, resolution imaging spectrometer hyperion is one of the sensor which is with 30 meter spatial resolution which you can compare with different multispectral data with 30 meter spatial resolution this is cris that is uh, compact high resolution image 
imaging spectrometer this is having capability um, to um, view with different multiple angles uh, which is useful for actually bidirectional reflectance function studies and high c as i told to you that is containing 550 meter spatial resolution very core spatial resolution but the sensors are having 64 spectral bands similar sensor was launched with chandrayaan 1 satellite that is having 80 meter spatial resolution then we are having ground based uh, instrument that is spectro radiometer nowadays even ground based hyperspectral imagers are uh, also available so isro hyperspectral missions as i told to you that everest uh, was uh, with the collaboration with nasa we recently flown on to the different parts of uh, our country and we have acquired airborne hyperspectral data gi sat is uh, geostationary imaging uh, satellite in this also we are having hyperspectral remote sensing data set but with coarser spatial resolution so in using this particular satellite we will get continuous hyperspectral data sets from the space now coming to the processing part of hyperspectral data normally it includes pre-processing then end member selection and classification so pre-processing includes radiometric and geometric correction. So I'm, I will talk about radiometric correction which is including the sensor induced error correction and atmospheric induced error correction. So if I will talk about hyperion data, normally hyperion data which is with uh, available with 220 spectral bands uh, in that particular data some bands are containing information and some bands are having absorption value um, absorption bands and some are containing no um, information and noisy information so those bands have to be removed before further processing then after you can see the example of this drop line this kind of drop lines are also available in some of the hyperspectral bands so this ba uh, drop line also have to be rectified by taking the average of the nearest neighbor pixels and after removal of this drop line you can see how your band will appear now coming to uh, atmospheric correction as your hyperspectral data your hyperion data is available in uh, radio radiance form so uh, this require also to convert that to surface reflectance now for converting that to surface reflectance there are two methods empirical approaches and atmospherical uh, model approaches so you, empirical approaches are required whenever you don't know any of the parameters like um, uh, atmospheric condition, aerosol condition, water vapor condition, uh, that date and time of acquisition. If you don't know any parameter about the data, then you can use this particular relative method that is flat field IARR. IARR is internal apparent relative reflectance and empirical line calibration. And these are the absolute atmospheric correction model which are using the radiative transfer model for giving you the absolute surface reflectance of the data. Now coming to spectra collection, normally for classification you require training signatures for classifying any of the multispectral or hyperspectral data. But in case of hyperspectral data, we can use ground based spectroradiometer and we can get this kind of spectral reflectance curve for uh, classifying hyperspectral data or even identifying any of the feature. So normally spectra collection can be done by two ways by using your image based method that is called as end member selection or utilizing the available spectral libraries. So spectral libraries are uh, some of the spectral libraries are available in NV software which is one of the very popular software for processing hyperspectral data. Aster Speclib is also available on the internet or you can create your own field or lab measurement using spectroradiometer. So this is one of the spectroradiometer you can see. So this is actually spectroradiometer. This is your white reference plate which is giving you 100% reflected energy. And this is the, uh, you can see this girl is targeting this particular feature with this particular pistol. So this is your fiber optics which is collecting the spectral data. And this laptop is required for uh, dis, uh, visualizing the spectral data whatever you are collecting. So this type of spectral data will be collected using this spectroradiometer. Now if you, uh, the uh, areas which are inaccessible where you cannot go to the field for collection of spectral data, then you can use image based end member selection. So end member is what? End member is the average spectral signature of a pure surface cover type in the image which represents a class that have to spectrally classify or identify in an image. 
and the process includes three steps that is MNF, pixel purity index and n-dimensional visualizer. So um, MNF is what? That is a data dimensionality reduction technique uh, in which we are applying principal component analysis twice. First to reduce the noise content present in the data. Then after we are applying principal component analysis again to get the components which are noise free enough. Then pixel purity index is to identifying the most spectrally pure pixels from the data and n dimensional visualizer is for pl plotting all the pixels whatever you have identified in that n dimensional visualizer and whichever pixels are appearing as pure pixel available at the end that we are e uh, extracting as pure class and that is actually use go we are using for classification. Now coming to hyperspectral data classification, this include uh, per pixel and sub pixel methods. So per pixel method is your spectral angle mapper, spectral feature fitting and sub pixel includes linear spectral unmixing and mixture tune mass filtering. So spectral angle mapper method is what? It is actually the um, um, utilizing two data sets. One is your image spectra and one is your reference spectra. Reference spectra may be your end member or your ground spectra collected using field. So angle between two spectra is calculated. So if you'll see this particular graph in this, suppose we are talking about two bands. So this is suppose your uh, reference spectra and this is your pixel spectra. So whenever we will plot that in form of vector, so here the advantage of this spectral angle mapper is what that direction of the vector is playing a role not the magnitude. So suppose this is your reference spectra and there are various pixels which I have to classify. So whichever uh, particular feature I have to classify if it is making smaller angle to that so that will go to this particular class. So in this particular case, if suppose this particular feature is available in the shadowed side also, which is having lowest reflectance, so that will also go to the same class. So you can see that here using spectral angle mapper, it, this is your one of the image which is having uh, variation in illumination. So this vegetation feature is available with two different colors. So whenever we have used spectral angle mapper, this is classified as single class, but with maximum likelihood, we are not able to distinguish these two particular features. So with this SAM, we are able to generate two types of output. One is your classified output and uh, rule images are generated for whatever end member or uh, reference spectra we have taken. So whichever are coming way darker or appearing darker are very closely classified. So you can see here if I am talking about three classes, whatever we have taken grassland, urban area and forest. So you can see grassland is closely matching which are appearing as darker. Here urban area is appearing very darker darker and then this particular vegetation features are appearing darker in this case. Now coming to spectral feature fitting. So in this case also normally uh, for classifying hyperspectral data, the image spectra and reference spectra should match. So in this case, we are focusing about the absorption features. So as if the shape of the absorption feature or depth of the absorption feature will match with the uh, target spectra or your reference spectra that will going to classify as that class. So suppose if you'll see this is your uh, one of the cuprite Nevada image. So we have used the alunite spectra. So you can see wherever alunite are present they are appearing as bright. So bright means good fit is uh, um, it is representing. Now coming to unmixing. Normally we know that sometimes uh, pixels which are having coarser spatial resolution contain mixed features. So you can see that is also categorized into two types linear and non-linear. So linear features are what in which you can you are able to separate out features in a uh, linear form. But whenever the features are available in the mixed uh, uh, thing like you can see in this particular image they are called as non-linear mixture. So they are actually if suppose they are available in the microscopic form. So what we can do, we can identify that what are the two features which are present in this mixed pixel. 
so for that we have two types of unmixing techniques they are called one is your linear spectral unmix which determine the relative abundances of the material depicted in the image so reflectance at each pixel of image is assumed to be linear combination of reflectance of each material present in within the pixel so if suppose we are talking about uh, i have taken three end members vegetation water and dry river bed so it will give you the different score present in that so here which wherever this is highlighted so they are representing the vegetation features may be available with different gray shades and wherever that uh, water body is highlighted in this particular case it means the water is having very very high score and in dry river bed you can see thus this a features are representing as dry river bed so normally it is considered to be as sum of all the features means each and every pixel is considered to be as sum of all the features present in the data a and it may be it is available with 0% contribution or 100% of contribution or uh, 70% so if it is representing one means 100% of that particular feature is available in that particular pixel now coming to mixture tuned mat matched filtering this technique performs a partial unmixing it will identify or it will give you the abundances of user defined end members so if suppose i'll uh, talk about whatever end member i'll give for classification so that end member will be highlighted and others will be getting suppressed so for this we are getting two types of output one is your score image and other is your and visibility image sometimes what happens if i am giving suppose urban feature whatever i have classified over here so if i am taking urban area so you can see here dry river bed is also getting highlighted but uh, for that case in visibility value if it is coming as zero or you can say very very less so that is uh, differentiating the false classification of that feature so you can see here in this particular case vegetation we have classified where score is very very high and invisibility is very very low now these are the softwares which you can use for processing hyperspectral data that is nv adas imagine is also having hyperspectral module and two open source softwares are there multispec and bim then coming to applications for this particular applications i have some case studies that i am going to explain so hyperspectral data can be utilized for n n number of applications but for this applications case study i am uh, explaining in my further slides so coming to your urban studies you can see this is one of the airborne hyperspectral image so this is the true color composite of airborne hyperspectral data this is the standard false color composite of hyperspectral data you can see different classes whatever we have used for classification of various features so this methodology we have adopted for classifying the hyperspectral data we have taken spectral indices spatial indices which is on the basis of texture analysis and then we have applied possibilistic c means classification and we have uh, calculated entropy for uh, and output evaluation we did so uh, spectral indices database classification so these are the classes which are successfully classified that is artificial turf clay soil mixed coniferous uh, forest mixed deciduous forest so you can see this is the artificial turf this is the mixed deciduous forest which is got classified then roof top of various features um, uh, various um, buildings then pasture then stress grass vineyard then mixed coniferous forest water body clay soil then coming to pca versus spectral versus spectral spatial indices approaches to dimensionality reduction so when you are identified you can see with the pca approach so accuracy you got we got is 30% user accuracy and 50% uh, producer's accuracy with entropy 1.07 when we use the spectral indices uh, then we uh, with 1.49 entropy the accuracy you can see it got improved then you can see with spectral and spatial indices the classes are properly classified and user accuracy and producer's accuracy also improved now coming to airborne long wave infrared hyperspectral data acquired with hypercam sensor so this is the details of uh, the long wave uh, infrared camera which is containing 84 spectral bands ranging from <coughs> 7.8 to 11.5 micrometer 
and spatial resolution was 1 meter. So this is and second image we have used was color digital photograph acquired with digital color camera with 0.2 meter resolution. So two airborne data sets were acquired simultaneously on May 21st, 2013. So this is the color digital photograph. This is the airborne long wave infrared hyperspectral data and ground truth location on of airborne long wave infrared hyperspectral data. So these are the classes we have classified using this particular data. So we have integrated uh, first we tried to classify with long wave infrared. So uh, in that case we got a uh, lot of salt, salt and pepper noise but whenever we have integrated when merged with that um, uh, ground uh, photograph color digital photograph this classification got improved and we have used with different scales so uh, image segmentation scale. So with 82 and uh, we got overall accuracy improved as 85.71. And then we have used also a knowledge base approach to enhance urban land use classification using integrated use of hyperspectral and lidar data. So this is one of the average hyperspectral data of US. So in this case, we have, whenever we have used same classification technique for classifying the four features road, building, grass and trees, we are able to classify some of the features but some of the classes are getting misclassified or unclassified. But whenever we have uh, used LIDAR data, uh, DM generated using LIDAR data as one of the parameter for classification, you can see whatever classes which got unclassified also came into picture. So you can see the comparative analysis of these three um, areas. So here the building and grassland is there which are not properly getting classified but with the use of uh, LIDAR integration these classes are properly classified. Here also in this case also you can see the vegetation areas which is near to this particular building is not properly classified. Here it is classifying properly and road also is classifying properly over here. So in this case you can see that misclassification is happening even building feature is not coming properly but with knowledge based classification it got classified here. Now coming to the mineral application so we can um, do mineral mapping using hyperspectral data. So in this case also we have used Hyperion data for mineral mapping. So lead and zinc mines uh, and uh, shows the presence of pyrohoetite in peripheral area. So in this case the three minerals whatever we have used hematite, pyrotite and uh, montmorillonite no, uh, so got classified in this two particular mines. This is Rampur Agucha mines which is uh, containing that uh, lead and zinc in uh, mines minerals and here you can see this poor banera mines where hematite content and other minerals are also present which is clearly visible. Now coming to hyperspectral remote sensing for soil studies. Soil reflectance has hardly any pick and trough thereby multispectral remote sensing has been a limitation for soil studies. So normally uh, it is preferred to study the complex features like soil with various varying composition of number of parameters so that can be discriminated through your hyperspectral data. So you can see the nature of your soil how it is coming only with the different um, percentage of moisture content the spectral reflectance values are varying. So this is with the um, where the organic matter is playing a role. This is hygroscopic water. These are clays, organic matter, and iron oxides. So you can see um, uh, factors affecting the soil reflectance are particle size, organic matter, soil moisture, iron oxide, and surface condition and soil color. So you can see with different uh, type of uh, sands that is sandy loam, fine sandy, uh, fine sandy loam, very fine sandy loam, how the spectral signature is varying. So with 100% uh, sand and when the organic component is changing, the spectral signature is also getting varied. With the moisture content also you can see whenever 1% is moisture, 5%, 10%, 25%, your spectral reflectance curve is getting varied and it is getting lower down. Then with loam soil with no iron oxide you can see how the spectral uh, curve is there and with the increase in red reflectance that loam soil with iron oxide. So how it is coming and iron oxide with the absorption band can be visible from here. Then coming to different type of uh, uh, minerals uh, you can see calcite, kaolinite, montmorillonite, hematite, orthoclase, feldspar how the spectral signatures are coming and these absorptions are able to distinguish various kinds of minerals. 
so you can see with different salt you can do even salt salinity analysis you um, and you can see how with the varying salt concentration how the spectral signature is coming now coming to vegetation for vegetation application you can go for vegetation stress monitoring which is caused due to natural agents due to air and ground pollutants that is uh, drought disease insects stress metals and acid deposition and ozone due to that spectral signature curve is getting varied so whatever if ve vegetation is healthy you will be seeing that high uh, reflectance in near infrared and that particular absorption which is visible in red wavelength even you can differentiate the uh, spaces vegetation spaces using hyperspectral data canopy biochemistry also you can study with the uh, hyperspectral data and crop uh, crop growth models and yield prediction you can do by vegetation application so you can see here i have used three data sets Landsat 7 ETM plus EO1 LE and EO1 Hyperion that 6 band multispectral 9 band and 140 mul, uh, hyperspectral bands. So in this particular case 3 vegetation species we have studied. You can even see overall classification accuracy was better for uh, Hyperion data then followed by LE data which is with 72.55% and with ETM plus 66.67%. Here you can see even misclassification was also occurring. This in this particular case, this is classifying to certain extent. Still, it is not giving you clear picture. But in this case, I'll just uh, show it to you. What are the reason behind that? The separation of proper vegetation features. So you can see. With Landsat 7 ETM plus the spectral signature curve of various vegetation species whatever we have used. So here very small differences are there in this vegetation spectral curve. But in case of your this EO and LE data whatever two vegetation are getting classified are having different nature of vegetation. The spectral nature is similar but the reflectance curve is different so that's why it is getting classified. But still a lot of misclassification happened which get reduced by hyper spectral data you can see the peculiar absorptions whatever was there in short wave infrared and uh, reason and this particular wavelength reason you can see these are giving you different absorption position which is able to highlight this vegetation um, spaces very very clearly now we have used hyperspectral data for water quality analysis so you can see this is the area uh, chilika lake uh, area so we have collected ground truth data for this particular location and these are the field spectra we have collected uh, while going to the field so this is the eo1 hyperion image false color composite of eo1 hyperion data of uh, to mar, uh, 8 march 2016 and you can see with different turbidity we have classified the data how the image is getting varied so with 5 to 10 turbidity the most of the blue features are uh, showing that 5 to 10 turbidity, turbidity and wherever the turbidity is high so you can see these are the areas where the turbidity is high now coming to spectroscopic studies for snake grain si snow grain size mapping. So how the spectral signature is getting varied with different types of snow. So if fresh dry snow is there you can see how what kind of spectral signature will be there and if aged snow is there so how the spectral signature will vary. And with soil if you want to compare you can compare with snow uh, soil also you can see the spectral signature is getting different. This is the instrument to collect the ground spectra as well as it is utilized for snow grain size mapping. Mapping. and with different grain size with 50 micrometer 200 micrometer 500 micrometer and 1000 micrometer how the spectral signature is getting varied with um, in terms of your reflectance so this is the snow grain size map generated using your hyperspectral data hyperion data of Ma 5 march 2010 and 13 Ma february 2015 so you can see the gra fine grain size medium grain size and coarse grain size are categorized over there so this green is representing you the fine grain this yellow one is representing you the medium grain size snow and this red one is representing you the coarse grain snow so you can see after five pairs whatever changes are there so that you can also compare in utilizing this particular data thank you